looking at the problem of a projectile rolling off the edge of a tabletop or whatever, uh, rolling off a horizontal surface and then falling to the floor, we want to analyze the projectile motion. Parameters? Well, this is an experiment that we're actually going to do to determine the velocity of the ball from how far it goes along the floor and how high it is when it comes off the ramp. So, what characterizes this motion? Well, we're going to let y naught be the vector from here to here, which is the height from which the ball leaves the ramp, xf being the final position of the ball relative to its initial position. If we put the origin of our coordinate system here, then xf is just the final position along the x-axis of, of the falling ball. Um, so, the motion is characterized by two things. You have a uniform acceleration equal to the acceleration of gravity, g in the downward direction, which I approximate is 10 meters per second squared. That's only off by 2% and it's easy to calculate with. Uh, <clears throat> so that's in the y direction. And zero acceleration in the x direction. That's all you've got to know to set this up. Now, ignore the r of t vector. We'll get to that in the y dot j uh, <clears throat> in, in, in a little bit. We're just going to analyze this by the fact that your y coordinate then, characterized by the uniform acceleration, well, the y coordinate in general is one half y acceleration t squared plus initial velocity in the y direction times t plus y naught. And the x is the same equation for the x quantities. Just the general form of uh, the, the position function for uniformly accelerated motion. In this case, initial velocity is totally horizontal, so initial y velocity is zero, so this term will become zero. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, y acceleration, we know it's going to be our negative 10 meters per second squared, so I've circled it. Uh, in the x direction, you have zero acceleration, so this term is zero. Since we put the coordinate system, uh, since we put the origin of the coordinate system of uh, where we did, the initial x position is zero. So that's zero. Note that the initial y position is not zero. Now we could have put the origin up here, and everything would have worked out fine. We'd have gotten the same result for the time of fall and everything and the velocity. Uh, but we chose this because it's a little more convenient. Okay, so anyhow, with this term being zero, this term being zero, and this term being zero, our equations end up much simpler. It doesn't really matter if they end up simpler or not, except that it's a little more work if they're a little more complicated. In this case, they end up very simple, and this is the general case for uniformly, uh, for, for uh, projectile motion uh, subject to constant vertical acceleration, zero horizontal acceleration. Okay, we've got these two equations. What do we do with them? Well, we know the acceleration in the y direction. That's just g. So I'll put a little circle around the g here to indicate that it's known. y naught is known. And neither v naught x nor the time uh, of, of fall is known. T the time is one of the variables we're going to solve for. Okay. x at tf equals x sub f. So when x equals x sub f, t is tf, and here we have this equation, xf being something that we know, tf being something, and v naught x being something we don't know. Now you notice that we have two unknowns here, so we're going to need more information to determine tf and v naught x. Fortunately we have that from the vertical motion. Here's our equation for the vertical motion, and y at tf is zero, okay, because 
the TF, you're all the way down here on the x-axis, so the y-coordinate is zero, the way we've set up from the setup of our coordinate system, we have this. So, that uh, when t equals tf, y is zero, that gives us this equation. This right-hand side, when t equals tf, has to equal zero. So, now we see that we have two equations and two unknowns. v naught and tf are unknown. We have two equations and those two unknowns. We can easily solve those equations. In this case, it's actually easier than it is in many. We have this equation that can actually be solved for tf, and that solution can be plugged into this equation to give us our xf. So we do that, and we're going to solve it for the uh, situation of an example that I demonstrated near the beginning of class, where a ball rolls down this incline and goes to the floor. Now, that doesn't exactly mimic this case, because this thing had to be on a, an incline in order for this thing to happen, so the initial velocity was not horizontal. Uh, so, you know, this case is a little harder to analyze. I make it horizontal. Well, I didn't make it fast enough. There we go. Got to be even faster. Okay. You get the idea. Uh, if I have the right speed, I can mimic this arc. And that arc isn't drawn very well. It gets too vertical. Uh, be more like, well, I don't want to do it. Okay. Um, anyhow, we measure these and find that this is about 14 centimeters. That's our y naught. And this distance is about 10 centimeters. There's our xf. So the second equation implies this. Uh, we plug the numbers in. And we do have one thing we've got to be careful of. Notice that I use the units, and I want to emphasize the use of the units, because here we have centimeters, and here we have meters per second squared. We have centimeters and meters. Now, they're perfectly compatible, but they're not identical units. So we would have to either express this in meters or express this in centimeters in order for the units to work out. So we always want to write the units. Now, I claim this comes out about 0.17 seconds. Okay, this uh, quantity under here comes out about 0 0.028 reciprocal second square uh, second second squared, uh, and the square root of 0 0.028 is approximately 0 0.17. Um, it's just a little less than 0 0.17, uh, so I think that's maybe right. It also goes along with what I know that if something falls a meter, just a little higher than the height of this board, it takes if it takes about a little over 0.4 seconds. So the height of this board would be 0.4 seconds. The height of the board is a little more than four times the uh, distance this fell because of the t squared proportionality here. Um, if it was exactly four times, it would be half as long as it takes half of the 0.4 seconds. It's a little more than four times as high, so the 0.17 seconds seems to me uh, very uh, reasonable. So I'm reasonably sure that I like that approximation. But fix, find it yourself, make sure you're careful about the units. Uh, down here, then, after we get to 0.17 seconds for TF, we just plug that in to our equation over here for TF, and TF is going to be XF over V naught X, which is here. And actually, we could calculate it here. Uh, and the way we've calculated it, just by rearranging this relationship, we get this. Um, this is the reciprocal of this, so it's a 0.17 second in the denominator and 0 0.17, 0 0.16 repeating goes into uh, 10, centi 10, 6 times, so we get 60 centimeters. If it was a little less than 0.17, this actually is a little less than 0.17, so I think we get something pretty close to 60 centimeters per second. Now, naturally, you're going to take a calculator and do all this, 
and you're going to tend to do it since you're engineering students without writing out the units. Okay? Uh, don't write out the units. You could easily get 17 here. Um, or 1.7. Uh, don't write out the units. You could easily get like 6 centimeters per second. Um, which is why it's good to both check your units and check if there's a way to check with what you intuitively know about the situation. Like in my case, I know how long it takes to fall from there to there because we roll a lot of things off the tabletops in the physics lab. Uh, okay. Now there's another way to set this up. That's in terms of a single vector function. Leads to the same results. Okay, so we have a vector r of t has an x component and a y component and the tip of the vector function. The vector as t goes from 0 to tf will trace out the path of the projectile. In general, if you have projectile motion, idealized projectile motion is generally set up with the x acceleration equal to zero, with, with the y axis vertical, so the x axis is horizontal, and the x axis, uh, x acceleration, acceleration in the x direction is zero. That's because you assume that there's no significant air resistance, uh, so there's nothing to exert a force in that direction, and we'll get to that later. Uh, the y acceleration is going to be negative, it's the negative g, the acceleration of gravity, uh, when the vertical axis is upward. So, our r of t function is going to be just you know, the motion in each direction is just going to be the motion you get from general uniform acceleration. In the y direction, that'll be uh, one half a t squared. A is negative g, so it's negative one half g t squared. But this is just your one half a t squared plus initial velocity times t plus initial position. What you always have for uniform acceleration. Here it's the same thing except the acceleration is zero, so we don't bother with the t squared term. And here's the t term and the x naught term that we would get from the uniform acceleration, uh, the form of uniform acceleration in the x direction. Of course the x motion is times i, the y motion is times j. So we think of a vector, this vector, this times i being a vector that as time develops gives us the x position. The vector gets longer and longer as our x position increases. The y vector here actually is going to get shorter and shorter. It's going to get shorter faster because of the t squared. But uh, you have this vector which would be the y component. So we have um, the vector here and the vector here. This one being the negative one half and blocking the board so you can't see it, but we'll see it in a minute. Okay, there's your negative one half g t squared plus v naught y t. Hard to read. But that's this vector. And down here is this vector. That's your v naught x t plus x naught i vector. This vector gets longer and longer, this vector gets shorter and shorter, and the resultant traces out this path. Okay, in terms of this vector, we know that r of 0 is y naught j. Because when t equals 0, you're here, and this vector uh, goes from the origin up to here. And that's your r vector. r vector is always rooted at the origin. At tf, 
the r vector is just xf times i. So that's pretty simple. Here's xf times i. Uh, and we could actually, you know, I, I was using the arrow to indicate a displacement. We could actually make that into a vector without changing anything except to put the i on it. So the vector xf i is the final position. It's the r vector at time tf, the final time when the uh, projectile reaches this point. Okay, v of zero is r prime of zero. Velocity is a derivative of position. It's the rate of change of position, and the derivative gives you the instantaneous rate of change. Um, and If you take the derivative of r, of, of, v, of r, you get the v function. I've got that derivative written up here, which is a very simple derivative. Uh, derivative of v naught xt plus x naught is just v naught x. The derivative of this whole thing is just negative gt plus v naught y goes to zero. There's your derivative. Uh, it's very straightforward. Everybody can do that derivative. Just keep your wits about you. Do the derivative. Okay, so there's your r prime of zero is v naught x times i. Um, because, of course, when t equals zero, uh, v naught y being in this case zero, well, actually, we conclude that v naught y is zero. Um, so, getting ahead of myself. Thinking in terms of what we did before, we want to think this through in terms of the vector function. So let me say again. The initially, r is v naught x times i. Because the motion is in the horizontal direction. There's no vertical component. Because of this, then, you can conclude from the vector function having this form, uh, v naught x i plus v naught y j has to be equal to v naught x i. Now where do I get this? v naught x i plus v naught y j is v of zero. If I plug zero in for t, my gt goes away and I end up with just v naught x i plus v naught y j. So this plus this has to equal this. You conclude then that the v naught y has to be zero because there's no j component over here. And now our r of t becomes this. In general, here's your r of t. You don't always have a zero y velocity. As you saw with the sloping uh, ramp, the initial velocity is going to be in this direction. You have an x and a y component. So that's not part of your general equation. But for this situation, we conclude that it's true. Okay, so there's your R of T function. Now what do we do with this? Okay, we've used the V of zero equals V zero X I to simplify the function to this. Now the R of zero equals Y naught J. There's no big mystery about what happens here, but let's do it formally. We're going to plug in t equals zero into this, and we get what we have here. Uh, this term's going to be zero. This term's going to be zero. We're going to get x naught i plus y naught j, and that has to equal y naught j. Okay. Now I ask why do we do all this, and my answer is why not? Um, just a pun. Okay. This tells us if um, if all this equals y naught j, well, all this simplifies to x naught i plus y naught j, and if that's equal to y naught j, then x naught must have been zero. So if we rewrite this equation with these two terms zero. We get 0 plus x naught here. 
No, I didn't rewrite the equation. Okay, I'm sorry. The x component, the, I'm sorry, the i component of the equation, well, the i component here is x naught i. The i component on this side of the equation is zero, so that the x naught has to equal zero. So we conclude that x naught is zero. We write out the j components. Y naught equals y naught. Well, we already, you know, we automatically know that. So now our equation looks like this because we can leave off the x naught. So this is the same equation we had here, except we don't have the x naught on the i component. It's a lot of work to draw a simple conclusion, but formally we want to go through those steps. And there, in, in more complicated cases, we've got to go through these steps because we're not sure. Uh, okay, so r of tf equals xfi, well, r of tf, we just plug in tf into our r of t function, well, this r of t function now, and we get this equation. The i components are equal, so v0x tf equals xf, so setting the i components equal, that's what we get. And setting the j components equal, well, this has no j component, so whatever the multiple of j is here, that multiple has to come out, or that coefficient has to come out to be zero, so this has to be zero, so here it is. And now these equations are identical to the equations that we had in our first analysis. So there it is. Now again, why go through all this? Uh, because many problems are much more elegantly and easily set up using the R vector. In the case of the simplest type of projectile motion, that uh, might not be so, but we're using that as an illustration of what we do and why. Now, for another illustration, we're going to consider our beloved motion of the rider around the circle. Except we're going to do this with symbols. Um, so here's the circular path of a rider, circle of radius big R. Can I did have a... I originally wrote that radius as little r and realized that was going to conflict with the r vector and cause confusion even though it would be okay because the magnitude of the r vector is r without the arrow. Okay, so we didn't have the stuff about the unit circle, we'll come to that later. And we didn't have the tangent line and so forth. All we had was a picture here with the radial line. Now, radial line, uh, a radial vector or whichever, uh, for a circle goes from the center of the circle out to a point on the circle. So there's your radial vector. It's an angle theta with the x-axis. Now we're going to say, okay, we have omega, omega velocity, angular velocity omega. And if the angular velocity is omega, then the speed of this rider as it moves around the circle, well, it's the velocity is the number of radians per second multiplied by the radius. Because every radian gives you a distance out here equal to the radius, and we got to keep repeating that because People don't grasp it easily. I didn't grasp it that easily when I did it. When I finally did, I said, oh, well, why didn't somebody tell me that? Uh, so I uh, had a good physics instructor, so I think he did tell me that. I just didn't notice. Uh, okay. So anyhow, number of radians per second is omega. Radius is capital R. So the speed is omega times R. Okay, well then, the velocity of the rider at angular position theta is what? Okay, 
we know the speed. This is not this is not velocity. This is speed. It's how fast. It doesn't include the direction. It's got to move around a circle. Okay. So the velocity of the rider at angular position theta is tangent to the circular path. Well, it implies that. Well, if you just confine your attention, I'm not sure I can do this without blocking it to a very small segment of the circular path. It looks like a straight line, tangent to the circle. Okay. And since temporarily he's moving along that almost straight line, he's moving in the direction of that almost straight line. And in the limit, that almost straight line becomes straight, and that direction becomes the direction tangent to the circle, which is, of course, perpendicular to the radial line. And you have to know the geometry of the circle. Since nobody teaches geometry anymore, that might be a challenge. But, you know, Learn about the geometry of the circle, just the basic simple geometry, um, if you don't know that. Okay. Um, so now, something I'm going to ask you to do for homework is to verify that negative sine theta, cosine theta, this vector, is a unit vector in the direction of the tangent line. Now that's going to be important because if we then multiply that vector by the radius of the circle, I'm sorry, by omega r, omega times the radius of the circle, we're going to get the velocity. Multiply the speed, the magnitude of the velocity, by a unit vector in its direction, we get the velocity vector. Okay, and to verify this, I'll give you a hint that cosine theta sine theta is a unit vector in the radial direction. And that's where I drew this little unit circle here. Now we don't know how big the circle is. If the unit is a meter, then the unit circle would be you know, a lot bigger than what it is. Uh, but I've just drawn arbitrarily a unit circle here and a unit vector a vector from the center of the unit circle out to the circle itself in the direction of a radial line. And that unit vector then, making angle theta with a positive x-axis, is cosine theta sine theta. The vector cosine theta sine theta. And your trigonometry should tell you that. That should be very obvious. And then the fact that you've got a right angle here allows you to conclude this. Uh, and I would also hint to use the dot product which gives you an easy way of determining the two vectors are perpendicular. Um, and if you've got to review that, review it. Okay. Ultimately, then, our, our r vector, well, okay, I haven't written it out, but theta is your angular position, which you get by multiplying your angular velocity by time. Okay, assuming that uh, you started at the point on the circle at the positive x-axis, theta equals omega t. So I'm going to fill this in. So your r vector is this. r times the cosine of omega t i plus the sine of omega t j. Um, which is just r times this unit vector, the unit vector being cosine theta sine theta, that'd be cosine theta i plus sine theta j. You've got to sort that out. You've got to really deeply understand that to where it seems obvious. So if it doesn't, make sure you think about it. So there's your r. Um, your velocity is the derivative of your r vector, the vector that traces out, whose tip traces out the circle. Uh, magnitude of velocity is r. I'm going to ask you to 
prove that. The acceleration is V prime, by definition, rate of change of velocity. Velocity being the rate of change of position, V prime is the second derivative of the position vector. Magnitude of your A vector is the magnitude of R double prime. If you just do two derivatives of this thing, you'll find that that's equal to omega squared R. You'll also find that that vector points back toward the origin. Furthermore, since V equals omega R, omega equals V over R. If I replace omega with V divided by R, I end up with V squared over R. Another two formulas for the magnitude of this acceleration. This acceleration points back toward the origin, so it's a centripetal acceleration. Centripetal means back toward the center. Um, and you can calculate it either as v squared over r or omega squared r. And this can also be derived from simple geometry, the geometry of an isosceles triangle. And we will probably do that at some point because I think it's important. Uh, but there it is.